Welcome to My Mind's Eye, an idiosyncratic look at mind and brain and mental disorders, all explored through research, ideas, and even music, but especially through the lens of My Mind's Eye. What's the difference between you and your brain? And is brain science dismantling personal responsibility? I'm here to talk with Mike Gazanica about these issues today. Mike's the director of the SAGE Center for the Study of Mind at the University of California at Santa Barbara. His most recent book is called Who's in Charge? So Mike, I gotta ask you, who's in charge? Well, luckily for us, Mother Nature has given us a, uh, an organ to to control our action, and that's the brain. And so I guess you have to think about the way the brain, with its patterning of impulses, allows us to carry out action. So there's a, there's a biologic machine in charge. Now, people don't like that idea because we're all essentialists. We all think there's some essence to the human condition that, uh, that makes us in charge. We have a theory about that. We build up a theory about ourselves about that. So even though while we think we are individually responsible for our actions and only us alone had input into that, uh, in fact, there's a rather sophisticated machine making all these decisions and knowing what to do. It's interesting to think about the fact that if you were actually asked to carry out a simple movement like move your arm, you wouldn't have the slightest idea how to do it. Your brain does so, and it does it rather exquisitely. Well, let's definitely get into that. What's the difference between me and my brain? There is an instant duality that we all uh, manifest. Uh, you and I as neuroscientists know that your brain is producing your thought, your speech, your language. I know that mine is decoding it and allowing for my understanding of what you're saying. Uh, but none of us believe that uh, your, uh, your brain is talking to my brain. I'm talking to Joseph, you're talking to Mike. We instantly do this transformation into the psychological level. Now the secret of how that all is done is really, I think, at the core of what we call commonly the mind-brain problem. How do we, in the one hand, provide another, le another level, another layer, depending on how you, you phrase it, uh, of reality to this uh, physical level that we all study. Mike, a key idea in who's in charge is the notion of the interpreter. This emerged out of your early split brain work. So before we talk about the interpreter, tell us what a split brain patient is. Split brain patients are, uh, are people who have not had uh, their epilepsy controlled by medication. And so a neurosurgical procedure evolved that uh, that uh, attempted to disconnect the two half brains uh, through one surgical process. And the idea behind it was that if a seizure started in one hemisphere, it would remain localized to that hemisphere. The other hemisphere would remain seizure free. And that would uh, prevent a generalized convulsion from, from occurring. And uh, that surgery uh, worked by and large when combined with medication. Uh, our job was to go in and look at, well, what, what's the effect of disconnecting the two half-brains? Can we begin to study what each hemisphere does in isolation from inf the influences of the other? And over 50 years, that's what we've done and uh, discovered a number of things about our brain. Okay, it's time to talk about the interpreter. Where did this idea come from and what exactly is it? Well, I'm sitting here talking to the person who helped develop that idea. <laughs> so <laughs> when I say uh, we, I want to make it clear to the audience that uh, you were a huge part of that. So there you go. Uh, it was a, uh, it was a d true discovery. Uh, I, the way I like to put it was that for 25 years, we'd been asking the wrong question. We'd been studying these patients. we have been studying what each function of their hemisphere was capable of doing, not capable of doing. And finally, we got around to setting up a test where we let each hemisphere simultaneously answer a simple little question, which required each arm to make a choice amongst an array of stimuli in front of them. And each hemisphere gladly did the task, and gladly performed the correct answer. And then uh, we finally had the bright idea to ask the patient, well, why did you do that? <laughs> Not what did you see? 
which we had been asking for the preceding 25 years, but why did you actually perform the way you did? And in this, we found a left hemisphere that was easily able to explain why it had picked the, the object it had picked. But in fact, of course, it really didn't know why the left hand had picked its object, because that was processed by the opposite disconnected hemisphere. But nonetheless, it jumped right in and made that choice seem part of the logic of the other hand's choice. In other words, it interpreted a response coming out from one of these separate modules and built it into the storyline of the ongoing cognitive state the person was in. And through that one sort of trial, all of a sudden it just opened up that, in fact, that's what we do to, to blend together this uh, multi-modular, separate, independent system. Most of this stuff going on outside of conscious awareness, when it finally bubbles up to behavior, there's this thing looking at it and say, okay, I want to put this part of my story because it keeps emer emerged from my body. And we did it. And out of that, you quickly get to, to all kinds of uh, implications for that, for the fact that you are building up a mental, mental states, mental beliefs that are part of a, uh, a mental life that is then in what way comes the question, constraining the brain. And that's the big $64 question that we're, we're all grappling with in this field, that while on the one hand you have the brain generating these mental layers, on the other hand the mental layers are real, and how do they in turn feed back and constrain the brain? That's the question of neuroscience, the deep question of neuroscience, and one we're all trying to get at in our own way. Let's turn to the societal implications of your work and especially the topic of personal responsibility in the brain and what your ideas on this mean for the legal system. There is a, I think, a misplaced concern that as neuroscience learns more and more about the physical aspects of the brain, about how things work in our mental life, that there is a, um, a sense of that kind of deterministic view of the brain means that we're not to be held responsible for our actions because there's just forces bigger than us play, being played out and we're just the vehicles for that sort of larger story. And I think that's a miscorrect way of characterizing the question. The issue is that where do you find responsibility? Do you find responsibility in the brain or do you find it in the social relationships between people? And once you understand, I think, that responsibility, the concept of responsibility and personal responsibility is in the social relationships people have as a group, then no matter what you discover about the brain, you will never impede, you will never impact that notion. So responsibility remains true and, and we are to be accountable for our action. These functioning deterministic brains that we all have can easily follow rules or not. They are, we are rule-following people, and that's a rule between people. So given that's the layer we're talking about, there is absolutely uh, no reason not to hold people accountable for their actions. And the question becomes, once we understand that, the question is, okay, they are responsible for their action. What do we as a society want to do with a wrongdoer? How are we supposed to handle that? Did we, do we believe in retribution? Do we believe in treatment? Do we believe simply in sequestering them off on an island so they don't bother us? What, what is it we believe in? That is a social decision that we as a culture will have to make. And I quite frankly don't think that we have enough data to know how to answer that question right now. So are there any practical implications at the present time, say for guilt and innocence in the courtroom? How this translates into the practical world of, of our justice system is, uh, can be played out in terms of how we actually now uh, do uh, bring people to justice. We have two part trials. The first trial is, is the person responsible? Are they guilty? And uh, the second part is, and we determine, yes they are, no they're not. The second part of the trial is mitigation. And the mitigation is where you're trying to figure out, well, is there some excuse that's, that you wish the society cares to take into account about this person committing the crime? And the judge, uh, through uh, an argument by lawyers and through a jury's uh, assistance, uh, tries to mitigate the crime or thinks about mitigating the crime in some way. 
right away when you understand how the process works, those are social decisions that a culture agree to or not. And so uh, while guilt or innocence, responsibility or not, it's fairly simple and I think we should just move towards cleaning that part up and making it a quick part of the trial. I think the, the hard work is to really determine what kind of social decisions we want to make about what to do about the person. Uh, and that is a, a far deeper question and a far more difficult question for science to understand and for society to understand. What do they want to do? There are different cultures now, for instance, in, in Italy. The concept of retribution and punishment is, is far lighter than in the United States. Contrary to your uh, popularized views of uh, the Godfather, the Italians don't particularly like punishment. And uh, whereas in uh, the norm of the United States is that we're a highly retributive society and three strikes and you're out and we want to do, well, which is right? What, what, can we carry out scientific examinations to look at the outcome of punishment on deterrence. Uh, there's a recent National Academy of Science report that just came out that says, in fact, there is no uh, compelling evidence one way or the other of whether or not the capital punishment has any role in deterrence. So these things have to be studied. This is where the focus should be, I think, on determining what we do know about uh, controlling antisocial behavior and what we as a society want to do about it. That norm will change through education, through time. It won't happen tomorrow, it won't happen next week. But that's what's in play in the long term. Well, Mike, it's been great talking with you today. You know, having been your student, I've often found myself trailing in your intellectual footsteps in one way or another. And even though I've uh, never worked on free will, your musings about it back in the day have stuck with me. So I wrote a song about it in your honor. Let's close this session off with Alexi Gambi's music video of the Amygdaloid song, how free is your will? How free is your will? Do you have control? Are you in charge? Who's running your soul? How free is your will? Are you automatized? Just a bundle of habits Is your freedom disguised? How free is your will? Do you make up your mind? Do you decide? Are your choices blind? How free is your will? Perhaps an illusion, a mystery, convenient delusion. your will once you decide are you compelled do you have to abide how free is your will can you change your mind reverse direction leave a choice behind how free is your will well of dignity, fountain of pride, sea of grandiosity. How free is your will, the stuff of lore, the source of evil, the reason for war. Truth to behold, the 
secret of peace A story to be told How free is your will The way to stand tall The basis of good The hope for us all